any announcements to the CTK and if we publish a new version, uh, it's all tracked there. So, going back to why we wanted to stay with the UI Painter. Um, staying with the UI Painter let us break down the process of creating an animation overview into the same process as developing a normal Visual Works GUI. So, push this button here. Again, this animation overview is a standard Visual Works GUI. So you can launch it in the application or in the uh, UI Painter, and you can use all the UI Painter tools to modify this um, this GUI. Start over again here. I'm going to launch. Um, Cairo doing all the, all the rendering for us. 
Um, so, you know, I have these tools that uh, that let me lay out the animation as though it were a standard GUI that we were developing in Visual Works. So, um, the UI pager had some of the features found in the graphics editing tools that I was familiar with. So it was the logical place for me to start creating my own tools. We wanted to add tools to the UI Painter that started to give that look and feel of a graphics editing program, uh, which meant that we were going to need to create new slices. And for those of you, slices are what you guys call those tabs when you start a UI painting session. I'm going to give you an example of a slice. So a slice would be, in this case, I wanted to create a slice that I could uh, list all the pattern fills that I found in my image. That's pattern fills are another uh, capability that the Cairo Graphics Kit added to Visual Works, which was using the pattern capability that Cairo offered, I wanted to create a class that represented that pattern so that people could easily create their own fill pattern and with a method pragma at the top and some subclass must or subclass responsibility methods, then their pattern would automatically be found by, by this tool and displayed using the new grid view uh, widget. So these objects are filled with these patterns, uh, but this is what I mean by having to create a slice that um, that supports this new feature. So this slice was created to add to the Cairo capabilities of uh, fill patterns. And to give you an idea, you know, in so it's currently this visual region is filled with this pattern, and this pattern has transparency or alpha. It's just actually this pattern is uh, of a class. PNG pattern. These are vector based, uh, and then there's some of them that are just PNG images. So you can take a PNG image, turn it into a pattern, and then have that pattern available on the pattern's palette and be able to just fill an object with that pattern. So if I wanted to fill this object with a checkerboard, I can do that. Um, if I wanted to fill it with this, I can do that. Um, and then there's vector based patterns as well. This vector-based pattern immediately tells me that it's semi-transparent. I can see the transparency grid behind. So if I apply that to this guy, I should see the widget behind. Colors, another example of a uh, pattern. It's a subclass of the color slice. Uh, I wanted the ability to control these uh, swatches programmatically to be able to give them a label other than the standard visual works label. Um, and I wanted RGB sliders instead of uh, HSB sliders. So that's what that is. So sticking with NBC, uh, why we decided to stick with NBC. And in the beginning, it was more like MV than it was NBC. So we added three views, um, the PNG image view, Pango markup label view, and the Cairo label visual view. They didn't have runtime controllers. Uh, and then a Cairo visual region doesn't either, but it's not really a view since it doesn't have a model associated with it. The action button view and the dendrogram view, uh, they do have controllers, but they don't exploit any specific behavior of Cairo. They're just your standard visual works controller. Uh, most of the controller work that we do, because actually there is a, a package called Cairo uh, controllers, uh, most of those controllers are revolving around extending the UI Painter's capability. So UI Painter has a controller. He has trackers that he swaps out as you're doing different actions. 
And so we created new trackers to add some of the new features. Like for example, the ability to rotate a component on a canvas, that was uh, a tracker that we had to create in VisualWorks to do rotation. Sticking with wrappers. Um, I'm not sure why, but visual wrappers in the visual hierarchy are sometimes kind of down. A lot of people don't like them. Uh, because it's an extra layer on top of the component that you have to worry about going through the process of adding all these wrappers. Um, I think that they're sort of an integral part of visual works. In my mind, the visual wrappers are what makes the visual and visual works. And so we decided that you know the wrapping process uh, for a Cairo-based widget would take the same approach as a visual works widget. So in other words, it's part of the component spec. What wrappers are required to create the component are part of the component spec. And we do that during the UI building phase. Um, Cairo components interact with their wrappers more than the visual works counterparts. So um, Cairo based components know how to get to their spec wrapper, their transform wrapper, I'll we'll talk about this, and then their layout wrappers. Because we sort of take a bottom up approach when we're doing UI painting or if we're resizing a component. Visual works generally takes on the visual hierarchy, they, they take a top down approach of, of making changes to the component. The spec wrapper gets notified, he then notifies the widget wrapper, he then notifies, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes we have things that are happening down below that we want to propagate up the visual hierarchy. So we interact with our wrappers a little bit more. <laughs> Uh, Cairo based views, so anything that's a uh, Cairo simple view, subclass of Cairo simple view. Um, Cairo based views can always get to their spec wrapper. So the spec wrapper is what holds the visual components DNA. Uh, and in the CDK, I mess with the DNA quite a bit. Um, Cairo based views can always get to their transform wrapper, and I'm going to talk more about what that is because the transform wrapper is really the integral part of what the CTK can do. Uh, most views have the ability to scale, rotate, or translate. So that means that you can make a button, or if you wanted to, you can make a drop-down list, put it on your canvas, and be able to rotate it. Why you want to rotate a drop-down list, I don't know, but technically you could. Um, any Cairo-based view or subclass of visual part implements a double dispatch approach. So, Stefan, this goes back to your question. Um, if you give a component a screen graphics context or a Cairo context, I expect that component to be able to render on either context. So, we decided to take this approach of doing the double dispatch. Um, you can give a Cairo component either one. And an example of when you might get that is the hierarchy browser, the visual hierarchy browser that you can use in VisualWorks. It only deals with screen graphics contests. So if I'm walking up and down the visual hierarchy and I want to be able to look at a Cairo based component that needs a Cairo context, I still want that to work in the components that we create. I'll give you a Quick demo there. Try <coughs> this again. Right. Quick setup here. So I've got this widget or this uh, application model, this animation, and I want to be able to do some live inspection on the visual hierarchy. So, Chris? Yes? Anika has a question. Yes? Did you have to uh, uh, inspector for your PNGs? Or? Yep, yeah, you can use a standard inspector for the PNG, and if you want, you can use the inspector that has the actual uh, view as part of the tab and you can see the image. Uh, again, that goes back to being able to give the PNG image view either a screen graphics context or a Cairo context, and it knows how to render on either.
So here I've just randomly locked in on this PNG image, and I can see from the visual hierarchy where it lives in my application model. So at the very top, there's my application window, and somewhere in that visual hierarchy is the item that I'm trying to, to, to look at. So what you're seeing here is, again, this, this window here is always giving my component a screen graphics context. But my component will know how to convert that into a Cairo context so that it can render inside this window. So that was really important for us because that, during uh, debug time, we used this visual inspector quite a lot to see how things work. And you can walk the entire hierarchy uh, the transform wrapper, this guy here, he is performing uh, the job of scaling this whole component um, in that if I wanted to, I should be able to scale this window and everybody scales accordingly. Um, Sorry, can you just explain that bit again? So in the inspector, yep. you're, you're using the Visual primitive to do the rendering? Yes. And the component then uses a double dispatch. So what the component does is it sends a message to the uh, screen graphics context. And then the screen graphics context sends the message back to the component and tells the component what to do. So in the case of a screen graphics context, the it would tell the component to convert that to a Cairo context. And Travis's bindings have a really simple helper method where you can send a message to a screen graphics context and you will instantly get back a Cairo context that you can draw. So, so it is rendered in Cairo, it's just, yeah. it's just splits it onto the... I, exactly, okay. exactly. That's exactly what's happening. Um, but then that way you can still use tools like this without having to modify these tools to, to work. So I talked about this thing called this transform wrapper, and I think that the affine transform uh, is probably one of the most important things in this Cairo graphics kit. It was the thing that we tried to figure out how we were going to manage so that other people knew how to use this Cairo kit. And it was so important that it got its own wrapper, uh, and it's called the transform wrapper. Um, it is what provides the CGK view with, or the CGK base view with the full range of transformation capabilities. So we can do rotation, scale, translation, and it's a wrapper. So if you want to create a widget and you have no need for translation, then that's fine. You go ahead and you create your widget, and you don't have to worry about uh, affine transforms. But if you then decide, ah, you know what, I want to add the capability of rotating my widget, then all you have to do is take that widget, that Cairo-based widget, and wrap it in the transform wrapper, and now you have instantaneous scale and rotation added to that, uh, to that view or widget. Uh, they also act as a composite container. And that was another thing that was important to us, because as we build up complex animations, Complex animations can be combinations of affine transforms in, in, in our world. So we may have one robotic arm that performs a rotation, but then he is part of a larger assembly that has its own transform wrapper. So if I want to manage moving stuff around, I don't want to have to worry about moving the individual uh, visual components that make up the representation of a robot. I want to be able to move just one transform wrapper that moves the whole thing. And then if I need to tunnel down into smaller pieces, then I can use the UI builder because the, the transform wrapper is a, it's a composite part. You can get to it from the builder. So you could say, you know, builder component at arm. And that would return you the transform wrapper for that component. So then you can play with it and manipulate it. I'll give you a quick demo there. Um, Transform wrappers also understand how to translate points, which is really important if you're going to build a controller. Um, if you want to build a controller that is going to interact with this component, then you want to make sure that the transform wrapper, no matter how far nested it might be, always understands how to translate the global mouse point 
down into the local coordinate space. So if I have a widget that is part of two nested transforms, one of them is performing scale and the other one is performing rotation, um, I want to make sure that if I click on something and it's on this part of the screen and then it moves over and I click on it on this part of the screen, the transform wrapper is the one that's doing all the work of translating the mouse point from global to local. And then controllers that interact with transform wrappers don't need to worry about mouse point translation because the, the uh, transform wrapper will take care of that for you. And the transform wrapper maintains its own damage repair policy. Uh, so I wanted to ensure, because again, transform wrappers are their containers. And if one little widget that is part of this larger container decides that it needs to get invalidated. Obviously, I don't want to have to redraw all the other items that are part of that container because that would just waste a bunch of time. So it's really important that the transform wrapper have an intelligent damage repair policy to ensure that only the component that needs to be redrawn gets redrawn. Yes? Did you see here uh, real time constraints or? We did, yeah, we did. Uh, Running inside our software is a whole bunch of other stuff. And probably the most important thing is what we call the machine scheduler. So it's the portion of software that's responsible for moving material through our system in a timely manner. And it's a small piece of AI. And that thing takes a lot of CPU time. So you cannot start that in favor of fast real-time animation. So we really have to make sure that when we invoke the refresh, that we were taking the right approach to make sure that only the thing we needed to redraw was being redone. And we actually looked at how Visual Works did it, and uh, we took a very similar approach to how they managed damage repair. Yes? So you're still using a sort of 1988 here, next step drawing on, you don't have layers and composite on the GPU with any of this stuff? Um, I guess it depends how you look at it, because in each call in the visual hierarchy, I would consider a layer to, to call. Cairo considers it a layer. So you don't render it to a separate texture and then compositing, or you're rendering into the same graphics context. We're rendering into the same graphics context. But Cairo, every time we do the render, then Cairo pushes that down onto its uh, surface. And then we do another display on call. That display on call ends up put it, pushing down. So. Uh, and then we use you know the, the capabilities within Cairo to do um, pushing you know the, the whole push stack pop stack where you can redirect the drawing operation to a, a, a temporary you know a, a temporary space and then when you're done move it back and so most of the calls within uh, display on when we when we draw something we will you know so are you using the um Cairo 10 memory surfaces for any of that stuff, or are you always redrawing from small talk? I, I should say that again. Um, and so with Cairo 10, you can record sequences of drawing? Uh, we're always drawing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it would record surface. Yeah, we're always drawing. Okay, let me quickly show you this uh, other bit here. Okay, so again, I have this picture of a robotic arm. I want this arm to rotate. And so wrapped around this arm is this transform wrapper because the PNG image by itself does not know anything about rotation. It's just a way to render a PNG image. But then I say, well, I want to add rotation capability to that widget, so I wrap it in this transform wrapper, which now gives me these feedback items on my UI and lets me now take this component as far as visual works is concerned and do my manipulation to it. So I say, okay, that's fine. Uh, I've got this arm, but now I want to add uh, a couple other uh, bits to it. And so I can say, well, I have this thing that I want to call waiver. It's X because this string Stick it here, I'm gonna push it to the back. 
Now I'm going to take both of these things and I'm going to make a transform group out of them. Now all of a sudden, I've got this new component because now the transform wrapper is not just acting as a single wrapper around a single component. Now it's acting as a composite on two components. So now, if I want to rotate that, now they both move. Okay. So that's important because when I want to move the carrier arm, I do not have to move the two items that are here. All I have to do is ask the builder for this component because it's got an ID to it. The builder returns that component, which is the transform wrapper, and then I just simply say rotate, and it begins its rotation. This outer border here that you see, this dotted line, that is something that we need to do to make VisualWorks happy because VisualWorks wants to know when it goes to build this thing, how do I lay this out? What are, what are your true bounds? What are the bounds of, of this particular component? And so what happens is when you apply a transform wrapper to, to anything, we do a calculation of how big this widget needs in order to display itself. So then that's what we feed back to VisualWorks so that it knows how to do a layout. Sometimes you may say, oh, well, you know what? I don't want you to um, report the maximum bounds. I'm going to go ahead and override those uh, with my own. Now, this, of course, would cause clipping, but you could do something like that where you could say, that's the bounds that I want VisualWorks to know about. So that's all I want you to, to worry about. If it goes outside of that, that's fine. Clip it. I don't care. Um, so now if I do the rotation, you know, off it goes. Um, there are situations where we do that. So if we're building up, like say for example, we want to build a fuel gauge. Uh, I have a picture of a needle that can rotate 360 degrees, but I want to clip it if it happens to go below there because there's a button right underneath there. And I don't want to render on top of my button. So I'll put it in a wrapper and then I'll clip that so that it never goes beyond there. Now, of course, you probably say, well, just limit the rotation angle so that it never does go there. But, you know, sometimes developers forget to do that kind of stuff. So you can also have sort of secondary fallback. So that's the idea behind the transform wrapper. Um, it can be applied to a single component or it can be applied to a group and it can be nested as far down as you want. So you can have transform wrappers, inside transform wrappers, inside transform wrappers. And you'd want to do that if you were doing something like this. Um, but 
looking at how we used to do it, <laughs> which was you know just swapping out images. To us, this represents a little bit more. We've also designed a lot of the parts of this to serve other purposes other than just animations. Um, you could build yourself a user interface if you wanted to, uh, because now we support widgets that support not only fills with colors, but you can also fill using uh, patterns, and you can also fill using gradients. You can also now take your Cairo-based widgets and apply transformation to them. So that means you can scale them, you can uh, rotate them, you know, whatever you, whatever you really want to do. Rotating widgets is, in an industrial environment, a, a lot more applicable than it would be if you were building, say, a desktop application that serves up a uh, standard, say, web page. Um, I need to be able to rotate a, a, a widget if I'm building a plumbing and instrumentation diagram. Those are those pictures with all those valves that you see uh, in a nuclear power plant or a, you know, a train control station where things are not aligned horizontally and vertically. Uh, things need to be maybe put in an arc. And so I want to be able to take visual works and build a user interface that I could do that. I could take a series of buttons, I could put them in an arc if I wanted to, and then I have my GUI. So it gives us an extra step on top of, of the standard visual works layout mechanisms. Um, you know, we're also happy because we can continue to use the GUI development methodologies that we're all familiar with, so I don't have to teach anybody a new way of building a user interface. They can continue to use the tools that they use and still get the more advanced features that they want. And then Cairo has a really, really good community behind it. Um, it is consistently or constantly evolving, and you know, for us it continues to offer some of the cutting edge features. And it's tested really well. Uh, we, you know, generally, you know, we'll build our own DLLs, but we rely on the regression testing that the community does quite a bit. The bad part about it is that it is a binding to the outside world. Uh, you know, external DLL bindings make most of our developers really nervous. Um, we have actually in big, bold letters on top of one of the uh, manager's queues, uh, stay within the VM, uh, because he does not like, so he and I are always at odds. Uh, and that leads to the next bullet, which is the first sign of trouble we have with the VM usually means me having to go and defend Cairo and tell the, the rest of the developers that Cairo was not the cause of the VM crash, somebody else did it. But it's still, I'm always on the defensive if something goes wrong with the VM. Another thing that we're finding is that most small talkers are not graphics guys. Uh, they love to deal, you know, with the VM and, and uh, all, you know, aspects like that, but when it comes to you know, putting lipstick on, uh, it takes quite a bit of convincing. So looking pretty usually is a high priority uh, around where I work. And as I say here, I can respectfully disagree. Uh, as you've seen, we're still stuck in motifs, so I'm trying to show you. Yes? I'm wondering why do you use Kerouac on the Well, I mean, if you look at OpenGL, it's a much more complex drawing model, you know, and, and the bindings, I know that you guys have bindings to OpenGL, but it's a much more complicated task with OpenGL than it is with Cairo. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, that would add, a, that would definitely add another layer. So when I'm, for example, if I'm a corporation and I'm going to spec out the cost of the user interface PC that's going to run on this tool, uh, I would need to ensure that every time a PC dies in Intel, let's say Intel, they're busy manufacturing Core i7s and the PC dies, I have to ensure that Intel can pick up the phone and say, I need a new PC, I need it in five minutes, which then means that I've got to stock the right graphics card that has the right driver model, uh, you know, so it, it adds to that complexity, whereas with Cairo, uh, you know, they have OpenGL backends, but the one thing I really like about Cairo is in their Pixman library, uh, they, they do a lot of uh, SSE, uh, uh, single instruction, multiple data, so the compiler, the, the SIMD intrinsics are how Cairo tackles the, uh, that, you know, the, the difference between trying to get the 
graphics card to do the rendering, or trying to get this, you know, leveraging some of the single instruction multiple data capabilities of uh, SSE. Uh, the other, yeah? A similar question the other direction. Um, I was considering not so using Hyrule, but um, I shy away from having a big, huge monster piggyback on, on my system. So why not just implement 32 right away? Because it's, it's basically kind of just a wrapper around the, the GDI. So, well, good question. Uh, again, I kind of go back to the way that Cairo does the drawing. GDI versus for those of you, what we're talking about is that Cairo sits really, when you compile Cairo, Cairo sits on top of GDI on the Windows back end. So Cairo is really interactive with GDI. But if you've ever interacted with GDI, you know that it's really hard. Uh, Cairo adds a layer of simplicity on that that I'm comfortable with. Uh, some of our developers are not, so the CGK adds another layer on top of that. So that instead of writing code to exploit Cairo, they have this WYSIWYG editor to exploit Cairo. So that's why we do that. Uh, what's next for Cairo? Uh, we are working on views, so vector shape, callout box, gauge, slider, progress bar, radio buttons, and then some graphing. So this thing called a dendrogram view, uh, line, bar, and pie charts, uh, new UI slices. So I want to replace the color slice and the pattern slice that I showed you to a more unified slice. One single slice where people can define their fills. So they can define a color fill, a gradient fill, or a pattern fill in a single place without having to click on the different tabs. Um, and of course, whatever would be specific to adding these new widgets to the palette. And then the ultimate goal is what we call the app model view. Uh, the app model view is my answer to the difficulties of creating a visual works proper widget. Because if anyone's ever tried to create a new widget in VisualWorks, you know that that can be painful. Because you've got to create a spec, then you've got to create the slices to configure the widget, and then you've got to create the widget itself, and then you've got to create the controller. So it's a long process. And what we find is that these, you know, if, if you've ever used VisualWorks and you know about a sub-canvas, and you know about uh, what you can do with a sub-canvas, my feeling is that you can treat a widget like an application model. So you can use very primitive building blocks to build up a more complex widget, but it's really treated as an app model. So it's kind of like putting in a sub-canvas, except instead of the sub-canvas being blank, it would actually populate that sub-canvas with the rendered view of the widget, and then you would have one slice, which would just be a table of all the things that you can do. What you're really just doing is modifying properties back on the application model. It would also then auto-generate a spec and a simple icon to put on the palette. So it would just be like developing in you know, Visual Studio where you can take a bunch of forms and then turn those into widgets at the click of a button. It's a, it's a much simpler process. So we're working on defining this because our, our, our developers don't like creating widgets. I'm the only one that ends up doing it. So what would I like to see from Syncom? Just one thing. Uh, the UI painter and its tools are starting to show their age. Uh, I think it's time for an overhaul. Um, simple, right? <laughs> I don't think so. I can tell you from experience that the UI painter and its tools is a complex beast, but there are some things in it that just drive me crazy. So, you know, for a small fee, I'll help you guys out. <laughs> and there's one more thing. This. <laughs> I ran into this so many times where, you know, what does this imply? It implies that this thing better be found here. <laughs> so a lot of times when we encounter this kind of stuff, I end up having to subclass and come up with some other creative way of getting to the outer container that doesn't involve nested intrudes and traversals up the, uh, up the higher. So, that was one of the other things that I was hoping. And so for my final demo, let's see if this works. Ah, nice. Ta-da! <laughs>